1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 26. Hear the word of the Lord. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that you come together as a church, and there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have, have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Do you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord, and we thank God for his word. As we continue on in our series on the church, remember this spiritual community that God is building from those who love Jesus and belong to him. We've come to the four pillars of the church that we found in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. We saw that the church devoted themselves to first the apostles' teaching. And we've looked at that. We see that the word of God, the Bible we've received, it's useful. These scriptures are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training us in righteousness so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's a truth battle. And the church must become, must be what it was made to be, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. We saw that in First and Second Timothy, those two verses were taken from. We also saw that fellowship, they, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. That was the second pillar. It's actually summed up really well in Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. We saw last week that fellowship is the church of God being what it's made to be. We have been united in Christ. We are one with the Father and the Son by the Spirit. And now we use our gifts to serve one another, to glorify God and to bless our brothers and sisters in Christ. And in Colossians 3, verses 15 to 17, Paul writes, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing praises, psalms, and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's a beautiful picture of the fellowship of the church, forgiving one another, loving one another well, walking together together as we follow Christ. Now we come to the third pillar. They devoted themselves, they committed themselves, they persisted in the breaking of bread. Luke is speaking specifically when he says the breaking of bread about this rite of communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's table. And so as we consider that, we're going to broaden it out. We're going to also consider baptism because those two together form the ordinances of the Christian church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are special things. Of all the things we do in the church, of all the rites and practices, our traditions, the breaking of bread at the Lord's table and baptism have a special place. The London Baptist Confession of 1689 says this in chapter 28. Article 1. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances of positive and sovereign institution appointed by the Lord Jesus, the only lawgiver, to be continued in his church to the end of the world. See Matthew 28, 19 and 1 Corinthians 11, 26. Article 2, these holy appointments are to be administered by those only who are qualified and thereunto called according to the commission of Christ. See Matthew 28, 19 and 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. 
If you wanted to read more, Articles 29 and 30 deal with baptism and the Lord's Supper individually. But instead of turning to the confession, as valuable as that is, and it is valuable, let's instead consider a few questions that come to us when we consider baptism and the Lord's Supper. And let's look at what Scripture has said about these things. So we're going to ask a few important questions today. First, we're going to ask, what is a sacrament or an ordinance? And recognizing that some people use different terms. Some people talk about the sacraments and some talk about ordinances. Why do they use one term or the other? We're going to ask, what are they? Then we're going to ask, what do they point to? What is their significance? And then finally, we're going to ask, why did Jesus command us to do these things? In many ways, each of these three questions could be a message unto itself. So we're going to move fairly quickly. We're at least going to touch on them so that we can understand a little bit of what's going on historically and within churches today. First, let's explore the idea of what is a sacrament. What does the word sacrament mean? Sacramentum is a Latin term. It was used in the translation from the Greek New Testament to the Latin. It was used to replace the word mysterion or mystery. And when Paul talks about a mystery, he's not talking about something we cannot know, but it's something that's been revealed to us by Jesus. Sacramentum itself meant a sacred oath. I think probably the most helpful person for us as we're trying to understand what a sacrament is, is probably Augustine. His perspective on a sacrament was much, much broader than ours, picturing more than just the Eucharist, picturing more than just baptism, but seeing other things as sacramental. But one thing that August, Augustine wrote that's very helpful is that a sacrament is an outward sign of an inward grace, a visible sign of an invisible grace we've received. And that's a really helpful idea. You will notice, though, that our Baptist confession didn't use the word sacrament. It talked about ordinances. The reason for that is, over the history of the church, the word sacrament has taken on some unbiblical connotations for some people. If we confuse the sign with the power or source, then we have made a grave error. It's possible that we will begin to think of the bread and the cup and the water themselves as possessing the power to give grace, that they in themselves do the work. And if we begin to think in those terms, we lose sight of the fact that the power can only come by faith in Christ. Perhaps a helpful illustration would be that of a hand pump. A hand pump is designed to draw water from a well and bring it to those who need it at the surface. But a hand pump in and of itself, just standing around, cannot give you water. It is not the source of water. In the same way, a hand pump, which is simply sitting idle with no one to pump it, doesn't possess in and of itself any power. What a hand pump requires is a source. It must be connected to a well. The life-giving water must be there. The pump is merely the channel through which the water comes. At the same time, it requires one with the faith to pump the handle, believing the water will flow. Understanding that that life-giving water resides in the well, comes through the pump, and they receive it. That is a helpful, although extremely limited, picture of what baptism and the Lord's Supper are. So why do we as Baptists often refer to these things as ordinances instead? Well, what does the word ordinance mean? It can be defined as an authoritative order or decree. And so, as the confession we just read stated, these things are ordained by Jesus. He commanded that we do them, and we see that in Matthew 26, 26 to 30, commanding the Lord's table, take and eat, drink. We see them in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, go into the world baptizing. As you go, you baptize these believers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are ordained by Jesus. Some traditions will also add John 13, 15, where Jesus tells his disciples, we looked at this last week, that he has washed their feet 
And if he, their Lord and their master, their teacher has done this, they also ought to imitate him. He has set forward the example for them to follow. We don't see John 13 in those terms, though. In fact, John 13 has a much broader application than merely washing each other's feet. It is an attitude of servanthood. It is a love for one another that doesn't value our place and our position, but instead says, I will get on my knees and I will do the menial. I will do the, the, the lowly because I love my brothers and sisters. It is a Philippians chapter 2 command. So if these ordinances, these sacraments are outward signs, visible signs of an invisible inward grace, what are they pointing to? What is it that they signify? Well, this is an important question. For baptism, I'm not going to go into it to a lot, in a lot of detail today. If you want more detail on what baptism and what it signifies, I would urge you to go to the message on 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. That was posted on February 27th, 2021. We looked at baptism in detail there. Go back, watch that message. I think you'll find that helpful in seeing exactly what baptism is as a confession of faith in Jesus. Baptism is a once-in-a-lifetime picture of our death in Jesus and our new life in him. Romans chapter 6 is very helpful in helping us understand that. And the question comes up often, do we need to be baptized to be saved? Or on the other hand, the statement comes up, well, baptism isn't necessary for salvation. And I think that's a very wrong and dangerous way to approach baptism and faith in general. I'm not going to say much about it now, and I realize there are many reasons why people do not enter the waters of baptism, why believers have not been baptized. But I would like to make this statement. If you are a believer, you ought to be baptized. The New Testament very tightly connects confession of faith with baptism. And again, not making light of the reasons people have to wait for baptism, not making light of the objections people may have or the fears they may have. I recognize those are often significant things. Nonetheless, do you not see the danger in approaching something which Jesus has commanded with an attitude of, well, is it really necessary? What does it say about our faith if we are looking for only those things which are required? If our obedience is a bottom line obedience, what does that say about our faith? What does it say about our faith when we are asking God, which of your commands are optional? Coming to the Lord's table, what does it signify? What is this outward sign pointing to? The inward, invisible grace. Well, the Lord's table, think about the terms we use, the Lord's table, we eat with him. We are sustained by the grace that only he may offer. Communion, we join together to remember that together we have been called to participate in his body and we have been purchased by his blood. How about Eucharist, a Thanksgiving meal? We gather for this Thanksgiving meal and we declare the one who has died for us and who is coming again and we will eat together at his great marriage feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb. This celebration, this eating together, this Thanksgiving meal is a warm-up for the great festivities we anticipate when he comes to take us home. In some ways, the question of why, why do we persist in these things? Why do we devote ourselves to these sacred ordinances? We've already answered that question. Jesus commanded it. Jesus told us to do these things. And really, that should be enough for us. If Jesus, the one we follow, has commanded us to do these things, if we really have faith in him, if we are trusting in him, if he really is our king and our Lord, we would do them. But I do think there are some practical reasons Jesus gave these things to us. I think we can see and understand them. And in fact, they are rooted in an Old Testament understanding of who God is. They're rooted in what God has already given to his people, Israel. Our 
sacraments, our ordinances of the Christian church, have their roots in Hebrew religion. Both baptism and the Lord's table were practiced before Jesus arrives on the scene. In fact, we see uh, the Lord's table, we see that it is the Passover meal. We see that baptism was something practiced by John. He was calling to the people, prepare yourselves, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So, we can understand baptism and the Lord's table, these rites, these ordinances. We can understand the why for them if we listen carefully. And the first of the two reasons I think that are most significant to us, the first of these reasons we find coming out in the book of Leviticus. Number one, they are teaching tools. Read Leviticus chapter 23, 39 to 43. Let me read it for you right now. So, beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of rest, and the eighth day is also a day of rest. On the first day, you are to take choice fruit from the trees and palm fronds, leafy branches, and poplars. And rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths so that your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. This is the celebration, the festival of tabernacles. They go out and they live in a booth because they remember that while they wandered, they were homeless. They lived in temporary shelters and the Lord brought them through. And for the generations to come, they were given this tool to teach them and remind them of the grace of God, his deliverance and his delivery of the promise. The second reason Jesus gave us these things, why he commanded these things, was because we are creatures of mind and spirit, but also of flesh and bone. These things are anchors and testimonies to the truth that we belong to Jesus, and all of his fullness is ours. Every time we as a community of believers celebrate the baptism of a brother or sister, we are called back to the cold flowing water rushing over and around us, enveloping us as if in a living burial. We died with him. We recall the moment our face and our head broke the surface once more, life-giving air taken back into our lungs. The pressure of the water on our chest is released as we emerge from the fluid and we recall the words of our Lord in John 14, 19, because I live, you also will live. As we take the wafer or the cracker or the bread, the preacher recites what Jesus himself gave to us. And he reminds us that he himself, Jesus our Lord, gave thanks for a loaf of grain. As we eat the grace we received because of his body that was given for us, it's given vivid and living color by the taste and the texture, the very act of eating in remembrance of him. The cup shimmers and it shines deep red. The fluid so evocative of blood reminds us of divine life of infinite value the price and guarantee of our salvation. As we drink, taking the fruit of the vine into our very biological makeup, its energy and nutrients sustaining our vital functions, we hear the words echoing through the centuries, but not diminished in the least, it is finished. These sacred ordinances are not magical. They are not esoteric. They are not mystical charms. But they do have immense power. They don't have a potency in and of themselves, but at the same time, they are more than simple tokens or vaguely symbolic rituals. 
Their power is the power of the living Christ. They are the things of this earth made by human hands from vegetables growing under a familiar sun. Precisely because, as the author to the letter of the Hebrews reminds us, we have a high priest who is also of this earth, who touched the sick with his hands, his hands of flesh, and he made them whole again. This is a God who walked the dusty paths of Galilee and Judea under the warmth of the very sun he himself created in ages past. Baptism is a physical signpost. Its water is real wet stuff. Because Christ himself, just before the testimony of the Father and the Spirit, declared him to be the Son of God, was plunged into the real wet flowing waters of the Jordan. Our religion is not an idea or a spiritual abstraction. It is a story of creation, loss, redemption, and renewal, which is being enacted in real time through the pages of human history. As you hold the bread in your hand, chewing it with your teeth, as you take the cup, tasting its contents on your tongue and feeling its fluidity in your mouth, these very down-to-earth and ordinary sensations have become for us, because of who Christ is and because what he has done, the very portals of heaven and the channels of grace by the Spirit's presence and power. As we eat by faith, faith itself is renewed and deepened. As we drink by faith, genuine hope springs with new life into our hearts, confidence in what we hope for, assurance about that which we do not yet see. As we celebrate this Thanksgiving meal together, this meal around the Lord's table, are you on the outside looking in? This communion meal is intended for all who belong to Jesus. If you have never put your trust in him, if you have never committed yourself to him and his truth above your own reason, above your own independence, if you have never turned your back on sin and self-worship, hear these words in the sacrament today. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters, you who have no money. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk. Without money, without cost. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We ask those who are on the outside looking in, those who have not yet made that step of faith, to respect the right. This is precious to us. But as you witness what we are doing Hear the invitation, come. For those who already know the blessed freedom that comes from taking up a cross daily and following Jesus, for those who walk by faith and share in the inheritance of the eternal Son, let the bread and the cup, their texture and aroma, speak clear testimony of what we have received. If you, Lord, kept a record of sin, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we, with reverence, may serve you. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. When you were dead 
in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And surely I am with you always to the very end.